Hi, I'm Philippa Brown, writer of Holy Hands, a handbook for intercessors. Today, yes, we're going to be talking, as the title says, about hell. I am under authority that of my husband, Andre, my pastor, Raymond Grant, and my king, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, uh, we will eventually get to the four aspects of wisdom just as soon as the Lord releases me to do so. But meantime, we are going to just follow, try to follow as he leads. Now, uh, this is not an attempt to scare anyone. It actually is the Lord helping us to escape hell. And uh, he doesn't want us to go there. And uh, I'm going to pray right now. And I invite you to join me. Father, we thank you for this day that you have made. Uh, you have brought us to a subject, mighty God, that I understand is on your heart right now. Because, Lord, you are trying in every way to save us. You are trying to save us from an eternity of damnation. You are trying to have us spend eternity with you. And, Lord, you have done everything you could, and you are still giving us time, and you're still speaking to us in the attempt to save us. Father, may we take heed. May we pay attention. May we understand what it is that you have done for us to save us, and may we understand your desire for us. Help us today as we hear. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. I will start uh, by declaring unequivocally that God is good. It's, it might seem like a strange way to begin a subject like this, but we want to establish some things based on Scripture. And one thing we have to establish here and now is that God is good. Uh, how do we know that God is good? The Lord says so many times in Scripture, so we see that, and if we believe, the Word of God, the Bible, as it is written, and uh, the Word of God says it, it says, God is good, says it many times in the Psalms. One of the most, sign most significant ones to me was when the Lord told Moses, he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. This was uh, one encounter on the mountain when Moses went up to meet the Lord. And the Bible says that the Lord proclaimed his name before Moses, and he said, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and in truth. And that uh, goodness that passed by Moses, even after the encounter was over and Moses returned to the people, the Bible says the skin of his face shone. Moses literally radiated the glory of the Lord. That was revealed in that encounter where the Lord said, I will make all my goodness, just one aspect of his personality. I will make all my goodness pass before you. And Moses literally glowed in the aftermath of that revelation. So we see that God is indeed good. Uh, another uh, greatly significant and probably even more so as it relates to everyone is Calvary is the fact that uh, God came to earth. The Bible said in the beginning was a word and the word was with God and the word was God. This is John 1. Verse 14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so put on flesh, he put on flesh, came down in the attempt to save mankind from the consequences of our own sinful actions. And this led Jesus to Calvary, where he died. He laid down his life. But before he died, he, he suffered. He was humiliated. He was abused. He was beaten, spat upon, and he took everything in the attempt to save us. We cannot say God is not good. God is good. And not only that, when he resurrected and he ascended up into heaven in the sight of his disciples, about 500 of them at the time, he told them before he left, he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. 
So the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of Christ in us, is actually He Himself. The Bible says so many times. And so Jesus said, Abide in me and I in you. So we know that the Holy Spirit in us is the Spirit of Christ. So He has not left. He doesn't plan to leave us. He said to the disciples, I, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. But the end of the age is fast coming upon us. And those of us who have not yet accepted that gift of the Holy Spirit in us, and we're going to uh, touch on that more at the end, We, uh, our end is in jeopardy. And the Lord wants to speak to us today about this. So I am going to relate an incident that happened about uh, maybe two years ago while uh, some intercessors were at the um, church praying and there weren't many of us, maybe about five or so. And we had reached a, a point where we were just like, you know, in different directions, uh, scattered about, not scattered, but here and there having a quiet time alone with the Lord. So while I happened to be kneeling at the altar. And while I was kneeling there, I began to pray for someone who was not, had not yet known the Lord. And uh, while I was praying for him, I saw right in front of me something that looked like, I can only call it an enclave. I, I don't know the exact words, but it's, it's like this, right? And in the middle of the uh, uh, boundaries of this uh, thing that appeared, there was fire. And to my surprise, I realized I was looking at hell. It only lasted for a, a few moments and uh, then it, it, it disappeared. So I thought maybe the person I was praying for, the Lord wanted me to pray that the person wouldn't go to hell. So I didn't ask him what it meant. I just assumed, which we should never do. Always ask, never assume. Anyway, um, I continued praying for this person and uh, prayed about hell that they wouldn't go there, that, that they'd come to know Jesus and be saved. So after the incident, you know, people are still praying quietly off by themselves. Then we would come together. And uh, when we come to, came together, the intercessor who was leading the uh, uh, meeting at the time, she began by saying, she said, the Lord just showed me hell. I said, what did you say? She said, she repeated it. She said, the Lord just showed me hell. And I said, but I just saw it while I was kneeling at the altar. She said, that, that is confirmation. Now she had received from the Lord instructions regarding what we had seen. And the Lord said, there are people here, meaning in the church at large, who are in danger of going there. And he said, we are to pray for them that they do not go there. And if they end up there, they have no excuse. This was a word from the Lord to the intercessor. So the Lord confirmed it that, you know, you, you can't really deny what you see. And we did see that. So let me say here that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels according to Matthew 25 verse 41. It was never prepared for mankind. And let us look at what the Lord Jesus had to say about hell. And before I read the reference, I'm going to read maybe there are two references you may want to read on your own. One is Luke 16 verses 22 to 31. Luke 16, 22 to 31. And Matthew 5 verses 29 to 30. So you may want to just yeah, read those on your own, but I am going to read Mark 9 verses 43 to 48. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. I'm going to read that verse again with the adding the meanings of some words and it might give you know greater clarity to the uh, passage and if thy hand offend thee or trip you up or entrap you 
cut it off, that is, if it makes us to sin. For it is better for thee to enter into life disabled than having two hands go into Gehenna. That word hell is Gehenna, the place of everlasting punishment. Into the fire that never shall be quenched, though the fire is perpetual and ongoing, where their worm or maggots dieth not, and the fire is not quenched or extinguished. It never goes out. And I continue, And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off, for it is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy eye, thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye, than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Now we could say these are very, very, very extreme verses, and they are. But they are extreme because hell is extreme, worse extreme. And it really is saying, what it's really saying is that by any means, miss hell. No matter what it costs you personally. No matter what it costs us, uh, even physically. If you have a problem with something that causes you to sin all the time, get rid of it. And uh, such is the extreme words that the Lord Jesus Christ used. Because he knows that hell is a place of eternal anguish. And the Lord Jesus Christ died for us, so we would not go there. Uh, the Lord, in this uh, 2021 he, uh, year, if we are alive now, we still have time. And time is a gift. And um, I'm going to share with you uh, a little story. It, it's true. I was uh, looking at someone who was close to end of life, and um, but very aware, and wondering how to pray, because I didn't know this person's status with God. And I, so I sat there and I said, Lord, how do I pray for this person? How can I help them? Because they are going to leave the earth, you know, sometime or so. And as I said there, I did not really necessarily expect an answer. I, I, I was just kind of searching in my heart and trying to connect with the Lord as to what to do and how to pray. But he said, I heard quietly. He just said, he responded. He said, what did she do with the time I gave her? I had no answer. I was very, I was disturbed. I prayed anyway, because you can always ask. But that question is a question that the Lord wants to ask every one of us. And actually, he is asking. What are you doing with the time that has been given to you? What am I doing with the time that has been given to me? Because time is a gift from God. Um, there is a book I want to recommend at this point. It, it's written by Bill Wise or Wies. I, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but it's W-E-I-S-E. -E. It's called 23 Minutes in Hell. Now, the book is very, very scripture-based. And he relates his experience. Uh, if you read it, um, just read it. It's quite believable. I have no doubt that he had that experience. In fact, a family member of mine that was reading, she had a copy on her desk at, at work. And she said her boss uh, walked over, picked it up, and uh, began to, like, you know, skim read. It. And she said he took it, went into his office, still reading. And then he, she said he went out brought three copies and gave a copy to each of his adult siblings. I do recommend it. And um, it is not to scare anyone or, you know, get anyone traumatized. But if something uh, gets us closer to God, that's a good thing. 
The Bible says Noah was moved with fear and he prepared an ark to the saving of his house. So sometimes fear has to move us to take action that will save us. All right, so look in Matthew 23. The Bible says the Lord reproved the sinfulness and hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees. And he said these words, how can you escape the damnation of hell? The thing is, he wanted them to escape. He wasn't saying that because he was in any way, shape, or form happy that they were living their lives in such a way that if they continued that way, they wouldn't miss hell. In fact, he wept over them. After he, he wept over Jerusalem. I'm going to read Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. And this is giving... Uh, uh, an idea, a record, a record of the final judgment. And this is a white throne judgment. John says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Very important here. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead that were in them. And they were judged every man or every person according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. That's Gehenna, of which we speak. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's Gehenna. That's hell. Now you can say, if God is love, how, how can he do this? But remember, we said that hell was not made for man. Man goes to hell by default because it wasn't made for us. Heaven was prepared for us. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. So you have to be in Christ. You have to be uh, a part of his family to be taken with him to his house. And if that hasn't happened, the, the, that, that transaction, that covenant hasn't taken place, then we can't go to heaven. Now, according to Second Peter 3, verse 9, the Bible says that God is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So you see, we said before, God is good. This is his plan to save us. That's why he died. And then First Timothy 2, verse 4, the Bible says, that the Lord wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That means if we look really at 2 Peter 3 verse 9, it means that God actually delays his coming so that me and you can be saved. And you know some people, they say, I know, you know, I've been hearing about God coming from ever since I was born until now, and I haven't seen him come. And uh, they, they use that as an excuse and a reason to not believe that he will ever come and to just live unto themselves how they want. But the fact is that what God is doing, he's actually delaying his coming. The Bible says that in, in the book of Matthew, he said, my Lord delays his coming. Why does he do that? Because he wants us to be ready. So it is mercy that he's extending to us. Because when that time is over, the time of grace is over, then will be the fulfillment of Revelation chapter 22, verse 11. And it says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. That means nobody will have any opportunity at that point to change. Nobody will have an opportunity to make a different choice. Because time will be over. Now is a season of grace, and the Lord is offering us salvation through his death, burial, and resurrection. 
This is the gospel. That's why the, it's called the gospel because it's good news. And the good news is that we can be saved from wrath. We can be saved from hell. We can be saved from eternal damnation, separated from God forever. And he's offering that salvation to us. You see, anyone who doesn't accept this offer is really saying, no, thank you. You know, and if you saying no, thank you to the salvation that God is offering to us. What are we saying? We are choosing to go with the one for whom hell was made. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that name is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died for us. Amen. So let us repent. Let us ask God to forgive our sins. And if you haven't been baptized yet, find, find a pastor. I know some churches are closed, uh, depending on where you are. But find a pastor, find a church. Ask to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Ask the Lord to fill you with his Holy Spirit. Because we must escape hell by any means. This is the plan of God. That we escape. Right, we're going to pray right now. Father, we thank you that uh, you have delivered your word to the hearts of your children, your people. And Lord, there is something for us to do now. We must repent. That means we must ask you to forgive our sins. We must make up our minds. If there's anything between us and you, anything on our conscience that is a problem, any unforgiveness or anything else that we know for a fact, separates us from you that we have to ask you to forgive us and we have to turn away from those sins your hand is stretched out jesus you are mighty to save and you it is your whole desire look what you did for us that we might be saved so we are asking you lord to work in the hearts of your people let us repent lord those who have not been baptized yet let them be baptized in your name those who have not received your Holy Spirit yet, let them come to you and ask, Father, that you fill them with your Holy Spirit. Mighty God, above all, help us to believe this word today. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you do business with God. I remember a young girl who was a new convert some years ago. I never forgot what she said. They asked her to speak and she went up and she said, God is a businessman. <laughs> she said, when you're ready to do business with God, he, he's ready to do business with you. So anyone who turns to God at this point, begin to talk to him and say, Lord, I want to be saved. I want to know you. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Believe me, the Lord is ready with a response. God bless you as you make your choice. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, choose life, choose well, choose Jesus, and be saved. God bless you. Shalom. Going up, 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 never down. Going up, stepping out, never fit into the crowd. Yeah, yeah, my time is now. Yeah, my time is now. Been out for a while, but so have we touching clouds. Yeah, going up. Yeah, we going up. Never slowing down. Yeah, you know we going up. Yeah. Life getting hard, it's easy to hate it Some of y'all ain't had adversity, y'all never